Okay, uh, let's get started. So in my last lecture, uh, I mentioned Hutchins Huxley equations. So that is a standard model for the uh, for the for the for the neural system. It's for individual neurons. So because the original model is for a piece of squid axon, and and also be generalized for a, a cylinder of, of the axon uh, to describe the activity of a neuron you need uh, many more of these equations coupled together so here's this idea suppose you have a neuron like a pyramidal cell shown here you may um, model this neuron as a piece of cylinders, right, or, or, or ball, where in the ball you assume that the voltage is same, same everywhere. So for each piece of the segment, you know how to model it, just based on the Hodgkin-Hoxley Hodgkin type of equation. Of course, the original equation only has sodium channel and the one potassium channel. In reality, there are many different kinds of potassium channel. There are also like a, like a sodium channel and other, other channels. It's much more complicated. But the basic equation is very similar to, yeah, to, the, uh, uh, it's very similar to the original equation, the same type of equation, right? <coughs> so here is the sch schematic drawing. shows if you look at one piece right, of, the, of the dendritic trees, you have a different cylinders, right? And each of the cylinder, you have the different ion channels, and different reversal potential and so on. And different segments, like say this is a, like a branching pattern, they're connected by this just a resistor. Okay? <coughs> then you form a big electric circuitry. So each is a compartment, it's called a compartment. You have a bunch of equations that are very similar to the Hodgkin Hoxley equation. Right? <coughs> so here's a little bit different. So on this then right here, there is a synapse from other neurons. So here's one neuron, but you know, they receive input from other neurons. So for the, for the synapse, uh, the equation kind of is similar, similar to the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. The only difference is that they have a different kind of ion channel. Right? So when you talk about an ion channel on the membrane, the two facts are important. So number one is what is a factor that open up that channel. The channel is like a, like a hole, a little pore on the membrane. It, it can be closed, it can be open. Right? But there's some factor can make this channel open. So one is the, vo the voltage. Right? The, the voltage across the, the, the membrane. Like sodium channel, potassium channel, as, as you remember, remember they depend on the membrane voltage. So it's a voltage gated channel. So another major type of channel is it's not gated by, by, by voltage, but it's by neural tr neurotransmitter, right? It's like a chemical. So once that substance is there, that neuromodulator, that molecule, that opens up the gate. So, so that, those kind of channels are very abundant in the synapse. Right? The, synapse is the synapse from the other cell, they, they, they release some neuromodulator and you're meant to open up the channel. So in, in, in a model, it's a similar kind. I just say this channel is not, instead of controlled by voltage only, it's really controlled by the, neuro, uh, the neurotransmitters. That they open, open up the channel, the current will flow through that channel. So that, that's, a, that's a second effect about the channels. Some factor open it up, but the, the channel itself also selective. Right? So it doesn't allow everything to come through. It may allow several ions to come through, but it's, it's also selective. So there's a third type of channel. It's very strange. It depends on both, so both on voltage and neurotransmitter. So that's turned out to be very important for learning and, 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 and the memory. It's called one, one of them is the NMDA channel, which I'm going to cover in my future lecture and see how that relates to, 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 the, to the learning theory. All right. So of course, you can sometimes simplify the neurons right, and make it the lump together some dendritic trees or, or even just simplify the cell just at a single ball a single point right? <clears throat> so let's give you one example about the realistic model you could compartmental model that you have a little compartment like the cylinder right? um, <clears throat> then we'll go uh, through several like a simplified mo model okay 
Let's look at the realistic models. This is the one fairly recent example. Uh, it's uh, based on realistic spatial structure of, the, of, of a neuron. They basically got this three-dimensional recontraction based on serial slices, right, and then recontract the whole thing. Very tedious work. Uh, the, the, the realistic model like this, you, you don't really know what's really, uh, what's the, what are the ion channel distribution you like to create the electrical behavior of the cell. When a great number of the ion channels open at the same time, we observe a firing of the cell, which results in the electrical signal or message being passed on to all connected cells. Well, there's even music. So there are many more, many more cells here. With many connected neurons in our model, we can start to see how groups of neurons contribute to network activity. Modeling this kind of complex activity helps us understand how neurons working together produce actions, memory, and higher brain functions. So this is from uh, the, let's take a brain initi initiative, uh, like a, like a, uh, this is the it's a European human brain uh, project. There's also a, a, a quote, brain initiative in the United States. That's an um, American version of the project. It's, it's, it's still ongoing. There's a new one, a, a, a Chinese version. It is, is coming up very soon. So these are examples of this realistic modeling. Here, what's realistic is the geometric shape of the cells, right? But what's not real realistic is modeling is that the distribution of the ion channels. But you may ask, if you can do this, get a realistic model, would that be what you want to do? Would that be, but the, the problem with the model is that there are too many free parameters, right? You look at this compartment. So each of the compartments, you need, uh, <coughs> you need uh, a, a, a set of equations, like, you know, each of the <laughs> compartment like this, you need a set of differential equations. For the real neuron, you, have a, you can have thousands of compartments. There are many thousands of equations coupled together. But the problem is, how do you know how many channels? What's the density of each type of channel in each different location? That, uh, the distribution of a channel, actually, it varies from location. Uh, for example, in a dendritic tree here, you have more like a, you know, like a voltage, uh, like, a, like a transmitter, like a dependent ion channel, right? For in the, in the segments of axon here, there are a lot of sodium channels that where you, the action potential actually, actually, uh, actually initiated. Right? And, and also depend on cell type. Different cell types have different kind of uh, channel distributions. So there are a lot of free parameters. Right? Eventually, you have uh, so many free parameters. In a big model like that, which we, we, we just saw, there are lots of assumptions built in. Right? It's very hard to know what's actually going on. And also it's very hard to know what is the strength of the synapse. So based on morphology alone, you don't know how strong the synapse is. And it turns out that strength is actually very important. This thing may be tuned to do different things just by different connection strengths. I, I will give you an example later time. <coughs> and also it's not tractable. You can only do numerical simulation. It's almost like an experiment. You play with the thing and see what's going on. But it's very hard to have analytical understanding, or like a mathematical understanding how things go. You know, it's just too complicated. To simplify things, of course, you need a simplified model to capture some essential property while you ignore some others. <coughs> Let's f I first go through this, right? If you want to do a realistic model, how can you do the model? Then we just say how to simplify this. We already talk about this, right? This conduction of action potential, right? You, I'm sure you have learned it already. So the idea, this is the neuron, you have a dendrite, this is the axon. The axon is the output of the neuron, as we said before. This action potential just travels down the axon. It doesn't change anything, it just travels the timing right, to, the, to, 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 the, to, to a distance. So of course, uh, as you remember, the thing works like you have ion channels, right? You, uh, the, the trick is that you have a built-in <coughs> gradient of at least two kinds of ion. One is sodium, another is, 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 is potassium. It's in the opposite direction. So, nor so normally you have a lot of sodium outside of cell. Once 
the cell is excited, which means the membrane potential is depolarized, the sodium channel opens because it, it depends on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the voltage. So the sodium, because you are building the gradient, the, the sodium flow, it flows into the cell. Right? So once the cell, uh, sodium flows into the cell, the, 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 the inside becomes more positive. In that case, you open up the potassium channel. The potassium channel is have lots of potassium channel inside the cell instead of outside the cell. So it's, all, it's opposite of sodium channel, uh, sorry, sorry, of, of the sodium ions. So the, the potassium will flow out of the cell to make the cell repolarize, right here, going back. So this thing will, will go forward. Right? So we, we, we mentioned last time that the, the conduction can be can go in both directions because the situation is symmetric. The fact that you have a refractive period that the channel depends on time, you cannot, if the cell is excited like this, it cannot be excited immediately. So it only go in this direction, but not go in the opposite direction. <coughs> All right. So you already know about this. Uh, so this myelination, just some of the cells have this myelination, basically some some strong cell, some cell basically like a just lipid, like a membrane that wraps around the cell as an insulation. <coughs> so that makes conduction faster. Uh, so this is a, just, a, just, a no, just a normal case, right? We just showed before, you have an inside, a sodium channel, uh, sodium ions make the inside positive, and this thing go, you know, travels down the axon. So as we saw la in my last lecture, so this is a very slow, massive conduction. To make this go faster, you have to make this axon very thick. Right. In this case, this is much faster. This is a, this, basically this conduction jumps around this, called the node of around there. So basically, those channels, the, 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 the sodium channel, potassium channel, they are not everywhere. They are concentrated over, over the nodes, the, only the, no, the node here, right? Because other the part in the middle is is insulated. You don't you don't have the ion channels very very little, right? So then, when this part gets excited, the current you know f activity goes from here jumps to the next location it's instead of just immediate neighborhood, right? So this makes things goes faster. So the real data, I may mean, just give you a quick quick view. It's a very old thing. It shows like this. if you recall from. <coughs> From activity along this, this is the nerve. It goes this way. The different knots here. You will see it, it. It propagates here. It's almost no time, and then there's a gap, right? It's just, so the time all spent over this different knot. The inside knot is almost. No, it just jumps over a different knot. Right. So this is much faster. <coughs> so in the human brain, we, you know, when in the you know a brain, you have. Both kind of uh, axons. Some are fast, some are slow. Then you have a super highway, but you have a very like a slow, like a like a slow lo like a local way. So you, you have all kinds of things, have all different kind of speed, right? So that's the action. Uh, that's axon. Axon is very, you know, very. The function is very simple. You just conduct the action potential goes through without disturbance. It's very, it's very simple. You have a, you have a. It's just. A <coughs> Conduction, okay, and also they can split. You go, you can split into two, and the same action potential. You split into two and go down two different branches of the axon. You can, you, you can do that too. <coughs> so, the dendrites. The dendrite is the input part of, of the cell. It's much more complex. You, have, you see, you got different kind of shapes, just like a tree. So you have different kind of trees. People say, oh, because they have a different kind of shape, that means they have different functions of the dendrite in different cells. Um, not necessarily, just like trees look different, and it means the tree branches and leaves have all different functions. Uh, actually, they actually have very similar functions, right? It's just like a geometry look different. So the, <coughs> so the standard theory of the, den uh, of the dendrite is sort of the path is the cable, is the cable, you c the cable theory. And basically, you, you treat this, the, the, the dendrites, as a cylinder uh, with, a, some, with a, a membrane, the membrane has some capacitance. You also have some resistance inside and across the membrane. You have some, some leak, uh, some leaks through the, me the membrane. So you can derive an equation. I'm not going to go through this, right? Because this is almost like uh, people initially describe it as, as a telegraph equation, right? To, to describe uh, the transatlantic cable by uh, Lord, I think Lord Kevin, the same, same person. 
Uh, so this is basically like a, like a passive, uh, like a property. Like it's like a, I think basically it's like RC circuitry, but it's except for this continuous cable. So this kind of system, <coughs> you can study how the activity, electric activity, spread over the cells. So this is maybe cell body, the different you know, different branches of that dendrites. People have studied this. Um, uh, I'm not going to go to the detail, just mention that there's one uh, very um, well-known theory. Uh, it's, it's not exactly true, but true for some cells, is that his argument is that by, by, by raw is that uh, if you have a cell body here, I say this dendrite, it's all like a tree-like structure, like a branches. Uh, usually the, the dendrite close to the cell body are thicker, and when you go further away, it becomes thinner. So it's just like a tree, so you would expect for trees. So he found out that if you have this kind of power, the, the, the diameter, if the diameter to the <coughs> one point, you know, <coughs> three halves of power, right? if, if this thing, the sum of the, of the, do, of the, do, uh, the, called the daughter dendrite compared with the mother, uh, if this sum is the same, then they're equivalent to a cylinder of the same thickness. You, you, <coughs> this is like a uh, <coughs> similarity ar uh, argument. I'm not going to do through detail argument because this is the, or the there's no absolutely uh, required that you have to the host you know the host the dendritic trees have to be equivalent to a to a cylinder of equal distance from beginning to end, right? Even though electrically it's similar, but but sometimes it's true for some cells, right? It's, 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 this is at least this is a benchmark you can compare with. Right? I want to mention this theory because pretty. Uh, Pretty, it's, it's like that. It's a, it's a mile, it's a milestone, right? In this, this, in this theory, right? <coughs> so I think I want to mention an another fact, which also quite important, is that for dendritic trees, right? If you like, say, there's a cell here. All the dendritic trees receive lots of input from many different cells, right? And the, the final decision made close to the cell body, right? This is soma. And then you generate action potential that go down the axon right, to, to other cells. But how the input to different parts of the dendrites are actually added up? Well, if you do a full series, you have to go back to that, that, that cable equation. You get some input and see how the thing. But it's, it's, it's still, it looks like it's a partial different equation, but it's still a linear system. Right? It's basically like a, like a, like a low-pass fil like like low filter, but they have a time constant, a spatial constant. Uh, I think one fact that's important is that <coughs> if you say, uh, let me see, if I understand this. Uh, <coughs> so the EPSP, because uh, you, you, you haven't learned this, right, in your lectures, other lectures, excitatory post synaptic potential. That means once there's, there's activity from other self and go down to the, to the den dendrites, you release uh, a, 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 a vesicle that's filled with a neurotransmitter, right? the neurotransmitter released, and then you open up some channels, like a, for example, like a glutamine channel or GABA, or GABA an energetic channel. Then there's some iron will go through this uh, membrane that changes that, uh, the po this potential of the postsynaptic cell. Right? So that's called the postsynaptic potential. Right? That's, that's just, <coughs> it just, the effect of opening the channels right, of, uh, that opened by the neuron modulator uh, on the membrane potential of the cell. Um, so this finding was that for, 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 for many cells in the hippocampus, and part of the brain people heavily study, uh, so that's the final effect, because no matter what happens, so we, if they're far away, you imagine a signal, it will be weaker when you when you when it, when it reaches this uh, cell body because of the passive property uh, you have a, you have a, you have a, like a resistance a capacitance you know when you when, when the signal goes through here it will be damped right it's, it's slower and also uh, it's also also weaker but somehow the synaptic current at the far away is compensated somehow it's boosted I mean as shown here the average post-synaptic potential if it's <coughs> very far away, it, it is actually larger, right? When the synapse is close to the cell body, 
its current is, is, is lower. Right. So the, uh, the idea is that when the signal, because at the, at the distal part of the cell, so far away from, uh, from the cell body, it's, uh, the signal, uh, the current into the cell is actually stronger. But when that signal propagates towards the cell body, when you reach the cell body, they're, they're about the same. Right? It's still be a little larger, but it's, it's quite close. Right? So the, the idea is that you, you boost your signal far away, right, to the extent such that when you reach the soma where you want to make a decision, everybody's, uh, it's about equal. Right? So, so that actually simplifies things, right, for, uh, for this bit. But it's not always true. Some cells are absolutely not true. Right? But for many cells, it's true, where, where they, uh, it's somehow compensated. Right? So in that case, you can treat the thing much simpler. Just, okay, I, you just add everything up in all, uh, almost the same way, right, regardless how where you are. All right, but, but that's not exactly true because the signal far away also is slightly slower, right? Because you have this capacitance of resistance. What's that? But this uh, so distal means far away at the distance. This proximal is, is close. Uh, yeah, so, 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 this is okay. They, they, they try to they try to they try to st try to stimulate some synapses here, right? This is got from actual research pa paper. This is ha harder to read, uh. and you record from if you record from here, you can see whether this synapse, uh, the, the EPSP, is the synapse over here, all right? You can also stimulate here. You get a synapse. You get here. There's always a like this is a synapse. You can see that far away means it's strong. Here, you, if far away, it's weak, right? It's it, it's weaker. At the same time, you record from a cell body called the soma, right? You, you, you realize this, the signal, when you reach the soma, they always is about the same. Right? That's the idea. Yeah? Why does it have a signal from the uh, dendrite? Um, what, why is it again? Why is it at the distal end or the proximal end? Or why is the signal for the... Uh, uh, why is it stronger than any other? It is, it is boosted. Right? You, you make it stronger, just you have more. This is the ion, the ion channel. So basically, you just open up the channel, the current flow into the cell. Right? Right. You want to make it stronger, you have more channels. Yeah, this is to, to make synapse stronger, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that. So, so with the, with the, for, the, for the synapse, there are several ways to make it stronger. Right? Yeah, so several ways to make it stronger, but it's, it's the, 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 the total effect is that the current at the distal is actually stronger than the current in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a proximal location. Yeah. yeah. So it's just based on ion channel time? What's that? It's just based on ion channel time? Yeah, it's based on ion channels, yeah. So I think this is a, a fact that's like a simplifying, right? It makes it look simpler. But I, I don't give you the impression, oh, the genetic tree, it doesn't matter. Look at your other function, I should not say it doesn't matter. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it doesn't matter. Right? Because last time I told you, like, if you want to detect the time delay, which direction is things moving, uh, in that case, the geometry actually matters. Right? <coughs> All right, so the, we have a talk about the, the axon and the dendrites. What about this, the, the, the cell body, right, where you make that decision? So as you know, this spike is generated at Go to the cell body, which was the initial segment of the axon. That's where that <coughs> action potential generated. That's the final decision. <coughs> because you add up all the inputs, some excitatory, some inhibitory, you add them all up, you make a decision whether you want to fire or not. If you fire action potential, you go down the axon, right? But the decision to fire, uh, how about this? Is this uh, deterministic or stochastic? You have already learned that in the brain, the neurons are very, the firing tend to be stochastic, right? Uh, which means if you record from a neuron, the sound will talk like that, 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 just like a very, sound very random. Sound very random. It's almost like a Poisson uh, per set. P Poisson per set would be if you threw a, a, if you have a line, if you threw a dart randomly at any point with equal probability, what you got is random and distributed, you know, discrete event, that's a Poisson per set. As, as random as it can be. 
So the neural spike tend to be very close to a Poisson process. It's a good first approximation, as random as can be almost. Where does this randomness come from? Uh, what, what, what does it mean? I mean? There are some other different ideas, but I just want to point out one fact, is that the spec generation is actually quite deterministic. So just show by this experiment. So this is a, you inject current into the cell body, right? Then you s we see how this voltage change in time, this action potential, multiplied current potential, right? Looks like it's a random location, but of course this is your the drive, is generated by computer. Try to simulate the EPSP for many other neurons. So if, if suppose you imagine if one synapse open up, you have a, a pulse of current, when right? it goes away. Then if another you know, synapse open up, you have another pulse of current. If you add up many, many thousand synapses, some the excitatory, some inhibitory, you add them all together, you expect to get something like a white, like a, no, like a noisy kind of input that goes through time. It basically is a bombardment of all the synapses from uh, onto the cell, right? This is sort of similar. This is generated artificially, right? So if you inject the current, you get this pattern. If you, if you, use, a, you, if you use a different random input, you get a different uh, specking pattern, all right? So this is the, action, uh, the, the voltage, and you only plot the spikes here, all right? Where the spike occurs in repeated trial, they repeat 25 times, right? So if you use the same random input generate computer, you can repeat exactly the same, same input, and you can see again, it's almost, almost the same. Right? So that means the randomness of that activity must be mostly because of the input to itself, is, is, it changes in a random manner. If you use exactly the same input, wiggle in the same way, you, you fire almost exactly the same spike again and again, right? It's, it's kind of deterministic. So it turns out, the major stochastic element in the brain is the synapse. The, syn the synapse itself has lots of failures. It's not reliable. It, ca it can be reliable if it, it, it needs to be, but in a typical synapse, in your, in your, in your brain, actually, it's not reliable. I if there is action potential travel down the axon, go all the way to the synapse, right? most likely that synapse will do nothing. It just sits there, maybe, eight, maybe 80 or 70 percent of the time. Maybe 20 or 30% of the time, it will be successful. Your transmitter will be released, the signal will go down to the next cell. Right? It's, it's an, but that's in whether it's a failure or success, that turned out to be very random. That, that's one major uh, random uh, source of randomness in the brain. So the spec generation itself actually surprisingly deterministic. Right? Right. <clears throat> so that's what you expect if you have a Hodgkin Huxley equation. The Hodgkin Huxley equation, you, you see, it's a, this, it, it is a Systems of ordinary different equations, but it's a deterministic. There's no noise, no randomness anywhere, right? Even though you see that each ion channel is stochastic, but that equation is the result of many, many channels put together. So on average, it's pretty deterministic. Except for when we really go to threshold, that's fl a small fluctuation, we'll have an effect. But, but typical situations look very deterministic. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Simplified model. So that basically people have tried to simplify models from a compartment model to an integrated frame model, some in a frame rate model, simplified model to capture some aspect of how the brain works. So the idea is that you can have a mathematical theory, right? You, you, can, do, you can do something. Otherwise, if you only have those so elaborate thousand, tens of thousand, millions of free parameters, you're really, you know, very hard to do anything. <coughs> integrated frame model. So this is the very simple model. Uh, it's a simplest spiking model. So what this works is that uh, you have this equation that looks like this. You have a, you have a capacitance, right here, right? you have a, the derivative, and you have a resistor. Right? This is like RC circuitry, it's very simple, you have some input, very simple. This is like a low-pass filter, you, you, you all know, this is a simple, <coughs> very simple circuitry. So the, the model goes like this. So you have a threshold, right? So if you, if you don't do anything, it's just exponential decay when, when, when this voltage reaches R0, which is we call this uh, resting potential, it just stays there, right? And you have a threshold and, and a reset potential in this model. So the idea is that as long as your voltage is between the threshold and reset, you just follow this equation, the linear equation, very simple. So just somehow, whenever, say this, this, suppose this is the random input, whenever this thing by chance reaches this threshold, then you assume there's a spike. It, it, but this model doesn't have a sodium channel. 
what, what has happened. I don't say how the spike generated, how it, it goes back. Just okay, there's a spike, and then immediately you reset to some reset potential. All right. We know in reality that the, that the voltage goes up because of the sodium channel. It goes down because of the potassium channel. Right? But here it, it doesn't care. Just okay, just just, just goes up and then go down. So once you go down to here, you go back to the equation again. It becomes linear again, right? And whenever you reach the thing, you have a spike again, just like that, right? <coughs> so if you have a like a like a like a, a step input, as it might have an input, a constant input, then you can solve the equation. You say well, you're starting from the reset. You go out to threshold, how long does it take, right? And you can see how the firing rate is a number spike per second, right, as a function of the current. You get some function like this. A function looks like this, this dotted line. There's the threshold. If your current is too low, it never reaches that, that, that threshold. If it's high enough, it, the firing rate becomes higher as your current input goes higher, right? That's, that's just like input operator relationship. <coughs> so if you have the random input like this, you have average, of course, even though on average you are below threshold, but once in a while, you, 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 by the random fluctuation, you may reach that threshold, right? So you get this dotted line like this, right? This, the firing, it, it increases with time, but it doesn't have a, this hard threshold like this, right? It's still fire a little bit, even if you have, very, have a low current input. So this is just a very simple, simple model. People use a lot, right? <coughs> Yeah, this is one example uh, in the vestibular system. In vestibular, in vestibular system, you need the system to be very linear. You, you want a linear input of relationship. And the neuron actually can be quite a linear. In this case, see, this is a, you have a step function, this have more spike. This, this is actually real data. Look like, look like an integral fire model, but it works almost like that. You get the firing rate at the function of the input current almost linear, right? For the, for the integral fire model like this, if you have very st strong inputs, the system become almost linear. Right. Uh, this is just this is some from some research paper. It shows a bunch of this firing mean, mean firing rate as a function of the mean input. You can you see the shape is roughly like that. Right? It's mono just have a I just want to show you that roughly what these things actually look like. All right. <coughs> So in mathematical model, the people, uh, this is, is it's very typically used, right? Even like in machine learning theory, people really use this as a sort of logistic function, or the sigmoidal function, they use a lot, right? Just, just basically, you capture a system as a, you, you have an input-output relationship. Right? That's sort of similar to that firing rate versus current in the curve. Uh, the sigmoidal function looks like this. There's the exponential function <coughs> here, right? When, when this input x increases, Positively, very large, the exponential goes to zero. So why approach one? Right? So if x is a negative, uh, this <coughs> become very uh, this become very large. So the y becomes one. So the, so this thing goes from zero to one. It's a monotonic increasing function. Or you can use <coughs> you can you can add a k to change the slope. You can add a Number like a C to change to, to the shift to the left or right, right? So the extreme case, which this is like a like a like step function, or a heavy side function, that's sort of related to this function by you, you, you should take the slope to infinity. Another widely used function is a, like a linear function with a threshold. <coughs> All right, so these are the functions people typically use for simplified models. <coughs> So there is one model that historically is important called the perceptron. So it's basically you may consider as a simple neuron model with a bunch of inputs right, from outside, which is add them up, like a weighted sum of the inputs. Right? I, I, they don't have a geometry, just like a one point. So the weight would be the s how strong each synapse is. Right? If, you, if that, so there's a successful neuro neurotransmitter, how much current you get into the, ne the next cell. And you have uh, another sort of constant h, is more like a more like a threat, like a like a like a like a threshold like parameter. You shift your curve left or right, and there the the g is called the gain function, which is a sigmoidal function. Anyway, so we just saw. Right? <coughs> 
So for this model, it's very simple. Even simpler, you can get rid of the nonlinear function because it's just a monoto monotonic increasing function. It doesn't change the relative ordering, right? <coughs> uh, so what's important here is the learning rule. The question is this. Suppose I have some inputs, x, there's, a, there's output, all right? It's like a, like a neuron. This is like a linear system. Uh, I want to change my connection weights, the W, which is uh, equal to the strength of synapse. I want to change the weight in such a way I want my input to generate some desired output. Right? You want to train my system to output, respond in a particular way. Right? So to do this, there's a rule called the perceptual learning rule. It will look like this. So each of the weights should change the delta. That, you know, the increment, the change, should be proportional to a product, the product of your input and the difference of your actual output of small y and your desired output is capital Y. Right. So this is called the perceptual learning rule. Uh, there are many in the name, the Wiedroff rule, Delta rule, because people derive this in different contexts, but it's very simple. It's simple as this is just a <coughs> because it's, it's a gradient descent of, on the square error. So the idea is that you want to make your, the difference between your desired output and actual output to be minimized, as small as possible. Right? You, you, you try to minimize this, this, this objective function. To do, to do that, you do a gradient descent. So that's a basically, if you, <coughs> you want to change your parameters, this W, the weights, right? This partial derivative vector is called the gradient, which, which points to the direction where that your function E changes the fastest, the increase the fastest. When you go in the opposite direction, in the minus sign, you go down, down the hill to, 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 to reduce, your, uh, reduce the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the error, right? So the little number, positive number, small number, uh, eta here, it just uh, <coughs> makes the learning slower, right? If otherwise, if it's too big, the things may not converge. <coughs> So if you use a chain rule to do a derivation, like we need to set on this, okay, first the quadratic become linear, then you make a derivative of your y relative to the w. So y, we already said, it is, it is depend on x in the linear manner, right? You make a derivative, which is back to w, you get x. So you can derive this, this rule very easily. So this is very simple, it looks like almost trivial, but this actually is the, ba the, very, the most basic method when people try to derive some learning rule. You have a learning system, you have an input, some output, you have some other parameter. If you want the output to behave in a certain way, you change your parameter and see which way you change the parameter to optimize your objective function. Right? You go down the, down the gradient. That's the, you know, the, this is the, most, the simplest method to try to learn. But this method will have a problem, but this is the most basic idea in machine learning. Right? All right, so I'll talk a little bit about this, 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 linear, <coughs> this, li this linear system, right? If you have multiple, if you have a <coughs> this linear network with multiple inputs and multiple output, you can do, I'll give you one example. You can do this auto associative memory, which is quite interesting and kind of surprising when you first proposed. All right, the idea is this, right? You look at this cell here, it got inputs from, it has a bunch of inputs, right? This cell is like a perceptron, right? So then you have your, your second cell here. Well, you do it in the same way, right? So the, 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 all these outputs, they're independent of each other, right? Because the, 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 the way this construct, this is called a feed forward network, the information goes from here to, to there, right? <coughs> because you have a bunch of input, a bunch of output. You can write this in a, in a matrix of vector form, right? So your y i and your y got inputs from a bunch of these axes, sum over them with these weights. So this is a vector form like this, all right? So okay, so this <coughs> this is the same as the same as the perceptron, right? This is have, have mu multiple of this single outputs, so I put them together, right? So now I want to have a bunch of inputs, 
uh, say this input, each input is one uh, used as, as a column vector here. Right? This is the first input, the second input. I want the first input to be mapped to uh, the first desired output, and second, uh, second input to map to second desired output, and so on. Right? So basically, what you want is to have this, um, <coughs> this X matrix, this input matrix. So each column is one input pattern. The time is weight to be mapped to the output matrix, which is each column is the desired output pattern. All right. So this is the you know the desired thing you want, right? But in reality, this is, is, is typically is not possible because the things may contradict each other, right? So the best thing you can do is just to minimize the square error between the left hand side and the right hand side of this equation. So the solution is very simple: is that this weight is equal to this matrix Y times the pseudo inverse of matrix X. So this is the you have already learned the pseudo inverse in your linear uh, algebra classes, right? So this, of course, this thing is that it's most useful for it arises most naturally when you solve this um, least square uh, problems. Right? You solve an equation like this. Well, um, the solution in general is like this: right? it's x equal to the pseudo inverse a times b. Right? It's a it's a it's a very general solution. Um, <coughs> If you minimize the square error between the left hand side and the right hand side, then you just multiply them, you get this, and you make a derivative. You set this derivative to zero, that's a necessary condition for the solution. Right? Then you get this so equal normal equation, that's a normal equation method. Well, in some cases, of course, when this A transpose times A, if this matrix is invertible, then you can just time this inverse matrix on both kinds of side, you get this solution, right? But if this matrix is not invertible, this thing's more complicated, right? So the pseudo inverse, uh, in general, you can define usually by uh, <coughs> singular value decomposition. But here, I, I w we only need to consider the case where this matrix is a full rank matrix, right? <coughs> so that's that solution we just showed. That is. This is inverse look like this. When this matrix is uh, m more than n, that's overdetermined. You have uh, uh, more data than the number of variables. Right? <coughs> this inverse, uh, you, you, if the pseudo inverse times a itself, it, it is identity. But the other way, it is not. Right? It's just only in one way. Because this way, this matrix is, is actually degenerate. It cannot possibly be, because m is, is a bigger matrix, right? m by m is a bigger, bigger identity matrix. <coughs> All right, so if this matrix is uh, underdetermined, I mean, you have uh, more variable than, than the data, right? In that case, the pseudo inverse can also be defined, right? This, this basically is the same as you, if you transpose the matrix, it, it go back to the situation we considered before, right? You transpose the matrix first, and you do the pseudo inverse as it's defined above, and you transpo transpose it back, so the result will be look like that, right? <coughs> All right, now I'll go back to this. Um, <coughs> so this is a use that optimal mapping idea. So here is this. So the input here, so each input is a is a grid level of a of a, of an image. Right? So this is a two-dimensional thing, but you think about this as a vector. You can concatenate, right? make a big vector that represent this image. All right. Um, the optimal linear mapping. So here is a very very clever thing that by by Cohonen. He does not map this image to something else. You can you can you can do that in your homework today. You you, you find a problem like that. But here just at a he have one use a very interesting uh, ask interesting, interesting question. Just uh, suppose this is the input, right? Maybe the second input, the different the third, and so on. You have a bunch of inputs, and you want to this input times some connection weights, right? 
connect with means each of the pixel we connect with the other pixel, uh, uh, connect with, an, uh, an, with, with another pixel, right? Um, the connection weights, and he maps this each image, uh, some connection weights map to itself, right? Basically, you, you have an input, you have a desired, you have, you have some bunch of input, your desired output is just yourself, right? In that case, you say, oh, that's easy. We just use identity matrix and map to yourself. That's, that's very boring, not, not interesting, right? So here, that you have matrix that if you use this, the result, of course, is this pseudo inverse. I just like, uh, let me see. In the solution here, you go back to here. The general solution is y times x pseudo inverse, but this is y here equal to x, right? What you got is this, <coughs> is this x times x, uh, x pseudo inverse. Right? That's the that's a solution. So this solution, so what's the relationship between this and that perceptron? Actually, it's the same. The perceptron is incremental learning. Every time I change my way, just a little bit. The final effect, if I you know, train many, many times, you try to minimize that <coughs> squ square, uh, square error. Right? So the pseudo inverse is I try to I get that square, minimize square error just in one step. Right? That's the final result. Right? The, the, the perceptron learning is slow because it takes many steps. Right? Here, just one, just one step, but, but, the, but the basic result is the same, right? So this here, just you learn some inputs to itself, uh, to map it to itself, right? So the benefit is this, once you learn the weights, then I give any input there is going to be out, give out, uh, have other output, right? The idea is that you, if you have your output, input is partial image, and so here, your output actually it's sort of like a recovery image, right? It's not a perfect, but it's very kind of a close to this one. Even though the, this right half of the image is missing, somehow just based this this connection weights, it should recover this image. So you only show the eyes can cover the image like that. Right? So that makes the system <coughs> actually more like the somehow more like the brain. Right? The brain remembers things, and when you give them partial cue, I can like, record the whole the whole thing. <coughs> the system is also quite a robust. If this is like this and go back to this connections like this, <coughs> so each of the pixel of the inputs map to uh, the output, output is actually the same. So if you cut a connection like over here, right, randomly, the system still works. It doesn't rely on, if you have like say one-to-one -one correspondence, say I map this first pixel, to the first pixel, so second pixel to the second pixel. That your matrix would be the identity matrix. If I cut that one wire, that information of that pixel will, will, will be missing, right? And that here, each output pixel receives from many, many other pixels, right? You cut any individual connection, it doesn't matter much. <coughs> so this is a very interesting uh, system. Even though it's just simple linear system, it's a simple learning rule, you can get do something like that. Or, or, or just with, even without any other things, right? So more about this perceptron. So the, the current machine learning, there's one method that's very uh, prominent today, it's called like a deep network, right? I'm sure you, you all probably already use this already in some of your research. Um, <coughs> so the <coughs> those things ought to all start from this, per, this, per, this per perceptron. Start from perceptron. So the perceptron is started in the 1950s. Um, <coughs> so I'm go back to perceptron. All right, not not just linear network. There's a, like multiple layer perceptron. Let's see what uh, some of the basic idea about this system. So as you know the perceptron is like a simple linear like a neuron. You have a bunch of inputs, weighted output. Uh, the output is weighted input like this, right? Which is kind of just a single single output. So now here in this case we want to say we want to. S uh, we want to classify people. Right? People, you have, say, their heights, and they have a weights. You want to see whether there's a team member of, say, like a, like a football team, right? You expect a very heavy guy will pretty more likely end up in this team. Uh, then this output is a zero, or either a team member or not, okay? So the question is, if you have a bunch of this example like that, right? You only gave me the inputs and the output, I can learn the weights in some way, right? Eventually, you give me enough example, you give me another person I never heard of, you give it the height and the weight, I can guess whether this thing, the team member will not, right? 
So this thing actually works that, that way. If you use real example, it will actually work. The reason is that if you plot the cases, I say this is the height and the weight. Suppose all the team member actually here, that's very tall, very heavy, which you expect for the football team, right? These are the guys who are not in the team, like that. If that's the case, right? I mean, if, the, if you plot each example, where's my pointer? All right, here. If the case is like that, is that all the examples, they are um, the cases that you can be separated by a straight line, a perceptron can learn this classification. This is a very simple classification task. Right? <coughs> you give any input pattern, they classify into two different uh, categories. But in reality, maybe seeing like this, right? There are maybe some guys not that heavy, they can be a good player as well, right? In that case, if a real student may be one like this, in that case, this perceptron cannot learn a situation like this, right? <coughs> I think I have offended someone. <coughs> so the perceptron, um, so learning why that's the case is because suppose you look at this input times uh, the, the, the weighted the inputs put together, right? Uh, suppose this equal to a, uh, we said it's equal to a constant. Um, what you get is a, is, a, is a straight line, right? Because this is just a linear equation like this, right? So, <coughs> so this is a dot product of your weight vector and your input vector, all right? So the dot product, so the any, suppose you have a the weight vector like this, this is this red arrow. Okay, so then you have a different input vector. Uh, as long as you, as if the, this dot product is a constant, all these inputs are falling on the same line, right? Because of the dot product. So the basically, your input space here, so all the, uh, all the, all the, all the, all the same outputs, are the, all those lines are in, run in parallel, right? All right, so I, I, don't, I don't elaborate on this, all right? So historically, uh, the perceptron movement is it's very very hard in 1950s. Eventually, it got um, it's no, no, people do not pay attention to it anymore because because of uh, people realize this system is very serious limited. Right? So if you have a problem like this, it's linearly inseparable. And separable means two categories of input cannot be separated by a straight line or a hyperplane in a, in a high dimensional space then the problem cannot be solved. It's not saying that you have a problem with, with, with your learning room, maybe your gradient descent is too simple. Is that because you cannot, you cannot use that to, to separate things, right? This is the one example, is the X-word problem. X-word is that A or B, but not both. Right? Then you, if you plot the output in the input space or something like that, there's no way you can separate these two different classes. Even, this, even, though this, even though this system is so, is, is so, so simple, this problem looks so simple. It took like uh, almost uh, 30 years, it's surprisingly long, in 1980s, this problem got solved. There's there another movement called this multi-layer perceptron. Uh, <coughs> is that all you need to do is just add more units. If you have an input directly go to the output, you add more neuron in the middle, have another layer, then you can solve the problem very easily. This is one solution. You can, as simple as just you add just one hidden, they call it hidden units. It means it does not, you, you have input, output, but this one uh, hidden in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle, that's all you need, right? In this case, this particular example, uh, so the number inside the circles are the, the, um, the, the threshold, okay, of the units. These numbers are the weights, okay? Suppose the input goes to here. Um, if you have only one input, all right, this, this weight is one, then you, you get the total input conversion is one, it's over the threshold point of five to drive the cell, cells active, all right, if you only have one. If you have a no input, there's nothing happening here, this is a point of five output uh, threshold, if your input is total zero, it's, it's quiet, that's okay, right? But if you both inputs are on at the same time, all right, the two inputs add up to two, you over, uh, you over the threshold 1.5, you drive the, the hidden units become active, all right? 
In fact, the hidden unit have a powerful inhibition to here to turn the cell off. So that is, uh, you cannot be both. Right? This, this problem can solve it. There are, uh, this is not the only solution. There are many different solutions. Right? You can solve this, this problem. You just add one more neuron. You just add, add, add a hidden layer. So it turns out, if you have the three-layer uh, system, you can solve many problems. In this case, this is one example from uh, Rosenberg Sznowski that solved uh, English pronunciation. You know, as you know, English pronunciation is actually very difficult. It's not very regular, right? Because it comes from different sources. But this one, just learn the inputs, are just different, the letters, right? You have bunch of hidden units, you learn the, pr pr the pronunciation. <coughs> so because this pronunciation rule is actually very complicated, the system is just Give them examples. You don't tell them the rules, right? The system, you just give them examples. They can just learn from examples. We can do, do a, pr a pretty good job. <coughs> so how does this system work? How is that this system can learn very complicated stuff? Um, well, one theory is about this function, uh, function, uh, 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 function approximation. We all know you have a Taylor theory, right? You have some basis function, which is the polynomials. You linearly combine them to approximate any function you want. Where you use sinusoid, you combine them to approximate any function. That's called a Fourier series. So for these neural networks, you use a bunch of basis functions. The basis function is just like a sigmoidal function we talked about before. Uh, you use those functions to try, try to uh, try to approximate any function one. I think I'm running over time. It's already 2.28, right? Yeah, so I have stopped right, right here. Right, thank you.